Hello, everybody. We are back at API's interface. Uh, you're in the uh, Ask Your Developer track, uh, let's say, to talk more about like the business, the digital transformation, the culture. So we had this first morning really about like the Ask Your Developer culture, the API first organizations. But now this afternoon, we will talk more about like how it is implemented in real, in bigger, in bigger organizations. And this is why today we're glad uh, to uh, have uh, people working on the, in the EPI teams uh, at Bosch that will come uh, talk uh, uh, with us uh, today. Uh, so we are glad uh, to have uh, Marcelo and David uh, to talk about us, to talk with us about, let's say, maybe the API journey at Bosch. Hello, Marcelo. Hello, David. How hey, are you? Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's good. Been, Thanks. Really great so far. And we, we don't expect less from you, uh, from <laughs> what we heard from others. So I let you uh, share your slides and and share what you have with us in in the in the screen. Yeah. Have a good All one. All right. Thanks, thanks, Maddie. So hi everyone, Marcelo here, and welcome to our talk. So uh, I'm very excited to be here today with you and together with my colleague, uh, co-host David, right here, <laughs> and also uh, with Georg, which unfortunately you couldn't join us today. We will talk about approaches we believe can be used to boost your API program. But more of that in a second. Uh, let me begin give you a bit of a background on Bosch. So we are roughly a 400,000 employee global company. And we're organizing in four uh, business sectors. The sector of mobility solutions. So where we're the only leading automotive suppliers globally. Uh, with an extensive portfolio of hardware, electronics, system solutions, software, and services for nearly every type of vehicle and powertrain. Uh, we have the sector of industrial technologies. So we are the leading supplier of software systems and a components of a wide variety of manufacturing and logistic applications. We also are in the sector of energy and building technology, where we have a portfolio of intelligent, connected, and efficient enhancing products systems and services for residential and commercial properties, as well business management solutions. And finally, uh, the sector of consumer goods uh, with our home appliances and power tool businesses. So Bosch supplies smart, connected, research conservative products and services for the home and garden, as well for professional users in trade and industry. So, all right, so th the question really is, it's 2021, do we really need to talk about the importance of APIs? Um, so the term in century now, can you believe that? It, it was first mentioned in the 1968 NATO Software Engineering Conference and on a data structures and techniques for remote computer graphics paper of the American Federation Information Processing Societies. So as a fun fact on this paper, uh, foundation API concepts like flexibility, independence, reuse, were already understood among the software engineering community. So while it's probably safe to say that most software developers tend to understand the value of APIs early on, it seems like 53 years later, there are still a lot of missed business opportunities that flew and actually is flying under the radar of company of all industries. And by opportunities, I don't necessarily mean those unicorn paper use APIs. Opportunities also include using APIs to increase process efficiency, reduce costs through automation, and simplify access to data. So why is that, I wonder? Why are those opportunities aren't being fully taken advantage of? Take Harvard Business Review, for example. They keep releasing articles about the importance of APIs. The one on the left side, which dates back to 2015, explains the strategic value of APIs and how they are the windows to new ecosystem and revenue streams. Fast forward to 2021, Harvard Business Review published another article highlighting again the importance of APIs, especially emphasizing they aren't just for tech companies. And just, that's just to name one publisher. So lots of other well-respected business publishers already address this very same topic frequently since at least, what, 10 years? 
Obviously, the fact that API, air quotes, add value is not a new thing. It has been covered extensively in the media, not to mention the fact that, as you are all are very aware of, APIs are today directly or indirectly embedded in almost everyone's life. And why we, and I, I say this as we, uh, the, the whole API community, still even need to convince that API is something that worth investing in. Don't we have enough API powered success cases? Well, it, it turns out there's a model that might help explain that. It is from Gartner and it's called the hype cycle that represents the maturity adoption and social application of specific technologies. This hype cycle have five key phases, starting from a potential technology breakthrough to peak of the expectations down to disillusionment and finally the mainstream adoption. But I want to direct your attention to the phase called the throth of disillusionment. So typically a trend ends up here after the technology in question fail to deliver to these original promises. And not by coincidence, the trough of disillusionment comes right after the peak of inflated expectations. So maybe that massive publicity we saw earlier could have created an API bubble, which burst into disappointment to several companies. To further support that, um, Mark O'Neill from Gartner said in an article about the state of the API economy, where, it, quote, web APIs have been going down the hype cycle throughout of disillusionment for some time now. Uh, this is because too many organizations have published APIs without forethought about who their users will be or what value chains they will enable. Um, so, but we'd love to hear actually from you in the Q&A if you experience the same bubble because we are not exceptions to that. Uh, but this same passion for API and our belief that they are the cornerstone of a transformation give us the feel to this slope of enlightenment. But in order to start climbing this slope of enlightenment, we would need a plan on how to convince at scale. So that is create new ideas that we would that that would help us to get the giant organization that we are on on board towards one direction. And that's why we came up with eight approaches that worked for us uh, and which we would like to share with you now. So number one, I think a very good start for an API program is to establish a brand and to give your activity a name. And we created a logo. So this is, this is ours actually, API first. We printed stickers, we, we made videos, we did internal marketing. And in our case, we noticed that many people associate different things with that, with, with that term, API first. Um, for, for us, it's basically a set of principles that you should keep in mind when you are developing an API or designing a system or product that will offer an API. And it also kind of describes a target state and a new mindset. Pretty, pretty simple, I would say. Now, the tricky part is to explain why API first matters so much. And we did that by making API first part of our corporate digital strategy at Bosch. And in there, we explain the strategic importance of APIs and the value for our business. So it's, it's important that managers and also the executives can understand this, this link so they can relay the message that APIs are not only a fancy technology, but also the foundation of digital value creation. So the, the brand that you can see here or the logo helped us that our colleagues can recognize what we are doing and that the term API first is understood. And it also makes it exciting to join and attractive to be part of that game. All right, so number two, have incentives. So let me start saying that incentives can be super obvious in some cases. For example, in a situation your public API will generate direct revenue. But in other situations, like when dealing with internal APIs, the story is a bit different. 
there will be always a demand for an API whose, whose underlying process owner uh, is not part of your IT team, nor familiar or what entails to become an API provider. So API ca uh, cannot and should not be someone's side gig. Uh, as I usually say, um, becoming an API provider is like going from making your own lunch to opening a restaurant. You can accommodate that easily on top of your daily duties without support from the organization. So what incentives you should provide for them uh, to become an API provider? So apart from the common uh, approaches of making uh, ownership a organizational goal, you could think in, in creating, for example, an internal API economy, which will allow API ownership to be attractive. So the result of this approach can generate high quality APIs, which will serve as an incentives for your API consumers to use it. Number three is providing guidance. So like we just discussed, when executing a company-wide API program, be cognizant that not everyone it will be familiar on what it takes to become an API provider. Many will have questions like, how do I deal with data protection, GDPR, for example? What legal aspects of my API uh, should I buy to? Uh, which compliance process should I apply? So in addition to the, to the incentives we just talked, it is important to have place people and documentation that can help guide them on how to become a successful API provider. So this guidance can come, uh, it can be provided actually in, in many dimensions to name a few uh, leveraging organizational setups, like having an API center for enablement. So that, that provides consultancy and even build APIs for your organization, uh, an API style guide and other guidelines, blueprints and best practices so people can refer to offline or even at concierge services for publishing APIs. So they should be able to help you navigate your organization complexity. So number four, promote a lighthouse project. Well, we recognize that it's impossible to convince the whole organization at once about APIs. It's very common for teams to wait for the result of other teams before starting themselves, either because of being afraid of failure or not having a clear idea what exactly it would look like, right? For us, it was a better idea to focus on those who are willing to make the first move together with us. Um, therefore, we created a, a little contest where you could apply with a project that we would support with our expertise for free. The criteria we applied to select our Lighthouse project were it should be possible to show early, let, let's say, success within six months. Um, the API should not be just, just a gimmick within the project, but very business relevant. And it should be run by a motivated team with the willingness to share learnings from it. So we, basically, we, we selected a cool project and a team that shared the same passion for APIs. And together, we are now designing a customer-facing product, helping them to demonstrate the value of APIs to the rest of the organization. And in order to become now a lighthouse, you should promote the heck out of it and make sure that it gets all the attention it deserves. So other teams then hopefully will be eager to follow suit once you can show them how successful your lighthouse was. And you also need those early success stories to convince more people in the organization. Um, especially when you talk to uh, to management and ask for budget, it's it's very crucial to have such proven examples. Right, and number which bring us to number five, cross pollination. So this works well in conjunction with the number three, which is provide guidance. So where I mentioned that having dedicated people, uh, best practices and strategies are super important. But those also have limitations when it comes to disseminating knowledge, right? Especially in a large setup. So in, mo in most cases, it won't justify you to scale that team uh, to address an entire organization initiative. So to complement that, think about establishing community of practices, having people outside the, your internal API core team interacting and helping other internal API fellows will help to scale the knowledge faster, actually, and more consistently. Number six, so let's talk about governance here. We consciously decided against 
a traditional top-down governance approach with strict controls and sanctions. And uh, well, instead, we, we, we have chosen to follow a community-driven approach in which our API experts are empowered to create and to evolve API governance. Um, we believe this will result in a more adequate and more sustainable governance. And adequate means governance is defined by those who have to deal with it later. If, if I have to eat my own dog food, I better try to make it tasty, right? And sustainability has two aspects. First, I eliminate resistance and the not invented here syndrome by putting those who, who have to live with it in, into the driver's seat. And second, rather than engaging in, in, in finger pointing to central governance unit in case um, the, the, the governance or the frameworks needs to be adapted due to changes in technology or businesses, the responsibility to keep governance up to date and helpful then rests with the community. That brings us to number seven, uh, have a way to connect supply with demand. And well, like in, like in every economy, there are these two main drivers, right? Supply and demand. And in this case, supply are the APIs that your organization is offering and demand are those APIs that others would like to consume. You can probably imagine that in a large diverse organization, connecting both sides isn't a trivial task. So it's very important that you make your APIs on the one hand side discoverable and on the other side, understand which APIs are needed by the organization. And in our case, just to give you an example, we, we introduced an API wish list where everybody can request a missing API and others in the organization can then review and vote on them. So connecting here helps you flourish your API economy. Right, so last but not least, number eight, developer portal. So often overlooked, a developer portal should ideally play a much larger role other than just serving as a documentation repository for your APIs. For example, it's a great place to connect your supply with the demand that Davis just told us. So in addition to host, again, the documentation that ideally will give the consumer every information he needs to start using an API, they could also provide like an API wish list, like we just learned, having a way to people request new APIs in case they don't find what they're looking for. Uh, case studies and examples. So highlighting applications that have been built using APIs, for example, the Lighthouse project. Uh, easy onboarding, like API rarely gain adoption, if you, as you know, uh, if you make it difficult to get started. So easy onboarding from self-registration to guided tour will help developers overcome the challenge of adopting an API. And even some things like operational status. So is your API available or temporarily down? So a simple status page reflects your API availability and will help inform developers and operations staff that sees increased errors uh, in their applications, for example. Right. So those were the eight approaches we wanted to share with you. But coming now back to the to the initial question, why we, we still need to convince? And the answer is because we are dealing with change, right? Possibly quite a large scale change, cultural change, process change, technology change. We are basically asking our organization to, to change the way we communicate, to change the way we, we, we collaborate, to change the way we do business at the end. And it's just natural that this transition takes time. And while this cultural change is not an easy thing to do, it's definitely the right thing to do. So we hope that one or, or more of our approaches can help you through your change uh, as it, it, it is helping with ours. And uh, don't give up, fellow evangelists. Don't give up. It is really worth it, I can say. And yeah, we know that there are some amazing speakers today in the parallel sessions. So thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thanks for being here. Now, we do have a couple of minutes for, for Q&A. And we'll do our best, of course, to answer any questions you might have. And also feel free to use that, this time just to share your experience about what we just discussed, right?
Yeah, thank you, Marcelo and David. So yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. The first question is like, who was your sponsor of the EPI program? Yeah, we have, uh, Maddie, we have, a, we have several. Uh, as, we, as you know, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, Bosch is a quite large company, uh, several business sectors. So we kind, we, we kind of reach out, we call the CDOs, right, of, of the organization, and they supported us in this initiative. So we, they get, we got the buy-in from them. Yep. So different sponsors, but uh, uh, the, the idea maybe behind the question is that sometimes it's just the IT sponsor. CDO is a little bit linked to the business at some point, right? Correct, yeah, correct. I think, our I think we have yeah. sponsors for, from, from multiple sides, as we said, right? Yeah. We, had, we had like the, the, the central, like, like the CDO of the of the whole Bosch group who's, who's sponsoring us, but we also have support from the business organization who have their own CDOs, like the business CDOs, which we call them. And 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 they they um, they, they they also buy in, in into our strategies and our, our program. So for how long have you uh, in, inside the Bosch uh, pro API project manager. Mm -hmm. Say it again, maybe, maybe you, you broke up. No, so I said, for how long in Bosch did you have API product managers? Product managers. Um, well, I think that varies widely. Again, I don't want to. I want to speak to the whole organization. Is like it's a four hundred thousand uh, uh, employee company. I don't want to risk. What's no, that? Dedicated on APIs, right? Right. So that what yeah. I was going to say that they might they might be living. I, I'm just afraid to give you the wrong answer. They might be living in an organization that we're not aware of. But uh, I think it's safely it's safely to say, um, and maybe David David can correct me out. I'll take it's easily safe to say that for over five or six years minimum, I'd okay. say. Okay. Um, uh, it seems at some point you say you need to engage more people than just the core API team, but right. like. For example, in the guidelines, let's say the EPI, let's say uh, guidelines, up to what type of stakeholders have you have you uh, reached uh, to right. include them? Right, I guess all sort of, but but those I guess which are more uh, frequently reached, which are not part of the of the core team, are those so-called functional experts. So they usually are a domain expert of of sorts. For example, from logistics. That, that person knows inside out, you know, our sales process. And all of a sudden, the organization have clear needs to use those functionalities over an API. So that person is being approached to say, yeah, can you have an API now to place orders with you? So that kind of person, those functional orders is the one by far that, that we have more engaged with, yep. So how much of the API consumption is internal compared versus external? In percentage, uh, yeah. Do uh, you want to go th that for David? No, no, go, go ahead. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so I, I think that there's a still a ratio of of uh, of maybe I want to say uh, the majority is internal uh, still because it, uh, there, we have a whole machinery uh, internally systems like different landscape, different platforms which are fully automated using API from infrastructure to our our ERP system. Uh, so it, it, I think it's heavily, it's, it's more internal, let's say, than external, the ratio, because again, it, it's a, it's a, there's, a, we, we're seeing a lot of room to improve, but also there's this trend of Bosch going uh, external as well. So we, we have more and more connected products, more of our coffee makers are even have APIs now. So this is, this is the, the, definitely the trend we're going. It's, it, they're duplicating APIs, but they now external ones. So now I think this. I think this is also the amazing uh, story of, of Bosch that we are uh, working in so many different domains of products yeah. in all these areas, and they are all now getting connected in this IoT and a, we call that AIoT, though AI and IoT combined. So this vision basically aims in in connecting all these great devices and products together and make them also available through APIs to the external world, right? Correct. But so, it, I agree with Marcelo that the, 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 the majority of use cases for API, and I, I agree to that, is internal because there are so many different opportunities that you don't see outside, right? So last question, uh, because we're at the time, but mostly question from me there. Uh, so uh, let's say, does the sponsorship of API building always require uh, a business case? Or sometimes some people build APIs because they have to be built, you know, for 
non-directly related business cases. Right. That's a good, that's a good question. I, I think we have both. So um, there's always the obvious one and the ideal one. The customer has a demand for an API. There's a need in organization. Uh, that all obviously happens. But the other approach that we're trying out is how can we proactively build APIs that we know uh, execute a, a, a company-wide process? Like I was saying, for example, sales, that's a function that pretty much everybody requires. So you, why we would wait for that? The demand will come. So why can what proactively put these APIs out there so when people need, it's already there. So we do a mix. Demand base and back to David's what mentioned the wish list base, but also there are opportunities that we see it's coming, then we build the API proactively. Perfect. Thank you, Marcelo and David. That was yep. great. Uh, yep. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, looking forward to continuing the discussion. All right. Thanks. Thank you very Eddie. much. Maybe. See you.